We're going to be reading from the book of Exodus. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang the song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The people have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. continuing in the third section today of the book of Exodus that we've kind of bit off here up to chapter 24. And so we've kind of taken it in chunks. The third section now is called Lessons in the Desert. We've gone through the Red Sea. We've seen the liberation of the Israelites. And now everything is in the desert. And it's going to be kind of a dry time sometimes for the Israelites. So we're picking it up chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, and that was the section that we had read um, at least the first 18 verses in our scripture reading this afternoon. We call this first section the Song of Moses. Verse 1 says that Moses and the people sang this song, and so you go through and you kind of hear everything that it sings about. It may have been written by someone else. We're not absolutely sure that it was Moses that wrote it. We can't be sure. It's often attributed to him. But I can't help but think how appropriate it is that they're singing this song after coming through these 10 plagues and then particularly through the Red Sea and having their enemies defeated and swallowed up in the Red Sea. They're singing this song of praise because, guys, let's admit it, we sing when we're overcome with joy, right? It's one of the things that we do as human beings. We, we express this joy that's coming out of us. And the song repeats over and over that God defeated the Egyptians who pursued them. In fact, it's very detailed in that. Look at what it says in verse 1. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. In verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. Verse 5 says, The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. 
And then in verse 10, you blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. We've got kind of vivid images of that this week from this Titanic capsule that uh, uh, imploded that went down to view the Titanic. So we've all had these kind of watery images in our minds, but this is very graphic and very specific in this song. Some of the things that took place in this amazing victory for the nation of Israel. And this was a defining miracle in the history of the nation. Think of it. Coming out of slavery, parting through the the Red Sea. It, It was like a baptism of sorts. In fact, the New Testament actually refers to this event as a sort of baptism, kind of this new beginning for the nation. Um, Just by way of analogy, most of you here have had a moment of salvation, right? Those of you that have come to faith in Christ, a turning from death to life. And you remember, hopefully, what that was like to make that decision to turn and to experience that moment of freedom. This is that same kind of moment of salvation for the nation of Israel. That's a good way of looking at it. It's a very apt comparison. Let me ask you this. Do you remember the joy of your salvation? They're singing this amazing song that somebody wrote, maybe Moses, but they're singing this song that they're praising God for what he's done to liberate them from bondage and from slavery. Do you remember the joy of your salvation? Do you remember the time that you made that decision to follow Jesus and the joy that came up into your heart? If you've never been saved, received Christ's salvation, then it's a hard thing to describe (laughs) that joy if you've never experienced it. To feel the weight of your sin and of your guilt and your shame lifted off of you, to know that God accepts you uh, is a powerful, powerful thing. And there's a reason why Christians are a singing people. It's actually something that differentiates us from most other religions in the world is that we're singing. Sometimes people ask, why do you Christians sing so much, right? We actually have good reason to sing. We've been liberated. We've been freed. And just like they sang this song here, Moses' song, we sing every week. We praise God for the liberation that we've experienced in him. I'm not going to reread through this first section, but I have a few observations I want to point out before we move further on. We're going to cover chapters 15 and 16 today. The first thing is this. This salvation that we see brings glory to God. And you see this referenced a couple of times. In saving the Israelites, it says in verse 1, Yahweh triumphed gloriously it says. And then in verse 6, Moses says, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. And so I want to point this out. Listen, guys, when God does something amazing, all of the positive impact for us that we receive is secondary to the glory that he receives and the glory that is being displayed by God. I, I w- always want you to keep that in mind. We're, we're so self-focused that whenever God does something amazing, we're always thinking about how that impacts us and how happy we are from it. And that's great, but never forget that all of that is secondary to the main idea that God is glorious and everything that he does draws glory to himself. And we definitely see that here in this story. God's glory is always what matters most. You know, here at Renew, we're sort of having our own Red Sea moment Uh, at this time when it comes to finding property. The search has been going on now for quite a while, a number of months. There just isn't much out there. Uh, You've heard the story that a lot of organizations don't want to rent to churches for a variety of reasons. The schools are not open to us anymore. And oh yes, the prices have also gone up 225% uh, since our last lease was signed. And so our office lease comes due the end of April. I'm just letting you know that ahead of time. We'll be talking more about that. Uh, 225%. So rates have gone up everywhere. The elders and the staff were praying about this. We encourage you to be praying about it as well. At the current moment, uh, we're running about 10% behind budget budget right now. Hopefully we can make up some of that ground before Uh, This budget term is over at the end of August, so we want to encourage you in that uh, to just really keep up your giving through this summer. We'll talk some more about that. But uh, we're we're in the process of trying to create a budget for next year, and you can imagine this is a little bit tricky, right? It's a little difficult. Do you know what I'm praying for? You're like, no, we don't know what you're praying for. I'm asking God to do something so glorious that only he can take credit for it. That's how I'm praying. So that all of the glory will go to God, 
when we find this solution. None of it can come to me or anyone else on staff or any of our elders or anyone in the church that all of the glory will be to God, that we'll see, wow, God alone could have provided this solution. How many of you would pray along with me until we find something in that same way that God would reveal himself and provide a solution that only he could get the glory for? How many of you will pray along with me until we do that? Thank you. Let's do that. Let's make that a daily subject of prayer. Let's pray for God's name to be glorified, that he would give us a story to tell that is so cool that we just tell it to everybody that we see and know for generations from now, just like this story that we're reading tonight got retold to everybody in the same way. We could do the same thing. God's name would be glorified, just like in the Exodus story. The second observation here is that Yahweh is a man of war. Did you catch that? How many of you caught that and went, ooh, that sounds a little politically incorrect, right? Yahweh is a man of war. Now, God is described in many ways in the Bible, and we shouldn't just isolate sort of one attribute or characteristic of God and elevate it above others. In Jesus, you know, he came to us as a meek and lowly baby, very gentle. And so we see different aspects of his character. But you know what? It is a good thing to know that he is a man of war sometimes. It really is. To be clear, God takes no pleasure in destroying anyone, but the fact is that he is a defender of his people. God always defends his people. And we sing this in the songs that we sing. We sing songs like, our God is a lion, the lion of Judah, right? And he's also a lamb, the lion and the lamb. He's both of those things. And that's true. You know, when your back is against the wall and your enemies are closing in on you, it can be really comforting to know that your God is not just some powerless wimp, right? It's kind of a nice thing to know that God is powerful. He can be a roaring lion and he can defend you when he needs to. It says here in this passage, your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy in the greatness of your majesty. You overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. Stubble is like a field after it's been trimmed. It's dry and it's ready to light on fire. In fact, Moses would go on in the Torah to describe God as a consuming fire. And that gets repeated in the book of Hebrews. Our God is a consuming fire. You know, when your enemies are surrounding you guys, I would encourage you, call upon God. He is a defender of his people. Call upon him. He is mighty and he can rescue you from anything that you're going through. The third uh, thing I would point out here is there's some great anthropomorphisms. Anthropomorphisms is just anthro is like man. Morphism is form. So an anthropomorphism is just something that describes God in a human form so that we can understand it better, okay? And there's lots of them in the Bible, but in verse eight, it says, at the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. Now we know that God is spirit. He has no physical form. He doesn't actually have nostrils, right? But the image that is giving, given to us here is simply that God breathed through his nose to part the Red Sea. That's literally what's going on here, right? This big ocean parting the waters, right? Hundreds of feet on either side. God did that just by going, right? Just breathing through his nose. That's not even the best place to breathe out from, right? You know, in Hebrew, anger happens through the nose, the word anger and nose are actually related in Hebrew. It's an interesting study. Um, you can probably figure out why, right? Right? But those words are related. And so the idea here is that God is angry and he blows through his nose rather than through his mouth and he parts the Red Sea for his people to cross. But here's the thing, guys. It was effortless to him. Effortless. So there's some great anthropomorphisms. The fourth Thing that I noticed here is there's a great rhetorical question in verse 10. It says, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Who is like our God? And so many of our praise songs are taken from this very text. Some of you have songs going through your mind. Who is like our God? We sing that. And it's a great question for us to ask as well. Who is like our God? I know in our day and age, you, you, know, you can take some heat if you pronounce that your God is higher than someone else's God or what you believe is superior to what someone else believes, but our God stands above all gods. 
Then again, Moses talks about his glory. Did you see that here? Awesome and glorious deeds. It's God's glory that is most important. The fifth thing I notice here is God's steadfast love is in view. In verse 13, it says, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed, the people of Israel. One of the most powerful words in the Hebrew Old Testament is the Hebrew word chesed, which is translated in many ways. Here it's what's translated as steadfast love. Those two words are actually one word in Hebrew, chesed. And this word is God's covenant love. It's his faithfulness toward his people. It's a hard word to actually pin down. It is so rich in meaning. I was actually talking about this word uh, this week with two of our elders, and the concept is very powerful. One of the elders shared with me Psalm, 90, or Psalm 89, rather, in which the psalmist, and it's not David, it's actually Ethan the Ezraite, he calls on God in times of despair, and he begs God to remember his chesed. Remember the faithful covenant of love that you have made with your people. And sometimes when you're down and out and everything seems to be going wrong, that's a great prayer to pray, to remind God you are faithful. You've defined yourself this way. You are a faithful God whose love is steadfast toward us. And so I want to encourage you in your darkest times, God may seem distant, but his chesed is a covenant that he has made with you. It's a covenant. God doesn't break his word. And you may suffer greatly in this life, but you can count on the fact that you will never be abandoned and that your story will end in eternal love and light. That is a guarantee for all of God's people. Now, you may suffer. You may suffer incredibly. There are martyrs in our history, right? You may suffer, but the end of your story will be good. It will be eternal love and light. The sixth thing here that I notice is Yahweh's name is magnified. In verses 14 and 16, we see that news of this great event, this passing through the Red Sea, that it causes the surrounding peoples to tremble. Did you catch that? If you go down through that passage, you'll see it. All of these nations that are mentioned, Edom and Moab and Canaan, all these ones that are mentioned are enemies of Israel. And they were quickly hearing of God's mighty salvation to the nation of Israel. And it says the terror and dread fell upon them. They were terrified. And this fear, God would actually use this to protect his people until they passed by them on their way to the promised land. That's what the passage actually says. When it refers to your, your own mountain, until your people arrive at your own mountain, he's talking here about Zion, about Jerusalem, this holy mountain, this city of God, where God reigns and everything is under God's control. Guys, we have the same faithful God today, and he is going to bring his people to reign with him someday. And Yahweh will, Yahweh will reign forever and ever. We just sang that in a song just a minute ago, that he will reign gloriously. I said it before, in everything, the most important thing is the glory of God, that his name will be magnified. And we actually started singing this afternoon with the song, Christ be magnified in me. Let me ask you, is that really your highest desire? We sing it like it is, but often our secret desire is still our own magnification. I know that's true in my own heart. And I'm assuming it's true for many of us. May the Lord humble us until his glory is truly our greatest desire. What would that look like? If his glory was really our greatest desire, if our life was really about drawing attention to God's glory and not to ourselves. What would that look like in our life? Verse 20, it says that Miriam grabbed a tambourine and all of the other women went out with her dancing. And they sang the first words of this powerful song. I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Does anyone remember singing a camp song like that? A few people, right? It went something like, I will sing unto the Lord for he is triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea, right? Is that the right one? Is that the one you remember? Yeah? It was a cool song and it was like very kind of uh, Jewish sounding, but we would sing that at campfire sometimes. Anyway, they were singing, they were praising, and it was an amazing victory. Followed by an unforgettable party, they were now on their way to the promised land. Everything is looking 
great. <laughs> Let's pick it up. Chapter 15, verse 22. I hate to do this, but we got to do it. All right. Chapter 15, if you have your Bible, verse 22 to verse 27. What does it say? Bitter water made sweet. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah, which actually means bitter. And the people grumbled against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And Moses cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. And then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. All right, so they just had this huge victory. It took three days. <laughs> it took three days. That's all it took for everything to change. After 10 miraculous plagues, followed by an even greater miracle of the Egyptian army being swallowed up in the Red Sea. And after having a huge party and singing a new song about God's miraculous power, it only took three days for them to forget all of it and to start complaining. They just started on their journey into the wilderness. They've run out of water. Their supply had obviously run out and they began to despair and to grumble. And God had Moses throw a log in the water. The water became sweet. In other words, it became drinkable. And then in verse 26, God gives the people a statute or a law. He says, if you obey me, I will protect you from disease. I will not bring diseases upon you like I did the Egyptians. Now again, guys, this is a very simple lesson for God's people in its infancy. And we talked about this a number of weeks ago that you can't just always take these as absolute promises. But the principle here, which still stands true and for us today as well, is that obedience generally brings blessing, right? God is trying to teach his people some basic principles. Obedience brings blessing. We understand that there's more nuance to it, but it still stands as a general rule today. The people and nations that obey God will be blessed by God. In some places, we talk about God's shalom, God's peace and just goodness that end up, you know, causing a society to blossom. This was always the vision for God's people, that the shalom of God would, you know, be among them and spread to other people. The line, keep all his statutes, actually refers to the feasts and the celebrations that God had given to them, like the Passover. In other words, if you remember where you've come from and what God has done for you by keeping these statutes, you will be blessed. As a people, you will be blessed. It's funny, guys, because we live in a culture that has forgotten God's goodness. And we're becoming a sick culture with no shalom, with no peace and goodness of God. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? How these things don't change. It's the same principle, and it still applies to us today. Well, in verse 27, God gives them a period of refreshment in a place called Elam. There were 12 springs of water there, interesting, one for every tribe, and 70 palm trees. It's basically an oasis. You can look up pictures of these in National Geographic. It's pretty cool when you see an oasis. You're like, why didn't you put one on the... I don't know, I should have done that. But um, look, look, look for it yourself. Do some work yourself, all right? Um, check it out. But it's, it's amazing, these oasis. In the middle of a desert, you can have this pool of water and all of this greenery, greenery that grows around it. And you can imagine in a desert, this is an amazing thing to find an oasis where you can find water and you know, water your camels and so on as well. But I think the lesson here is that God leads us through hard times, but he also gives us seasons of refreshment, right? We go through some difficult times personally, as a church, right? God also gives us seasons of refreshment. And it looks like they stayed there for a number of weeks before continuing on their journey. 
so let me just put this out there. Are you, are you due for a season of refreshment? Most of us say, yes, definitely. We, we, would, we would all say that. But some of you, really, maybe you are. Maybe you're really in a place where you're kind of desperate for a season of refreshment. I just want to encourage you, hang on. It's coming. It's coming. God will bring that to you in its right time. He is a God of seasons, and he brings us through seasons, and he brings us to seasons of refreshment. Well, the next section is bread from heaven, chapter 16, verses, well, the whole chapter. Let me just read the first 15 verses, and then we'll talk about it. It says, they set out from Elam, all good things must come to an end, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died at the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. That's a big lesson right there, right? Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Let's just stop there. Now, the exact location of these places is somewhat in dispute, um, but you will remember that Moses actually fed Jethro's flock in the Sinai area. We're not exactly sure where the Sinai area was. There are a few spots that people think it may have been. But either way, we know that he fed Jethro's flock in that area. So he's probably somewhat familiar with this territory. That's an interesting thing to think about. And after three to four weeks at the spa in Elam, the people have now spent some time in the desert. And once again, things are not going well. They're hungry this time. They filled all their water bottles, apparently, but they're hungry. There's no food right here. And they complain, if only the Lord had killed us in Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. Because after all, that's everyone's dream, is just to be eating to your fill when you die, right? That's the best life you can have. There's a frightening truth, guys, that comes through in this passage, and I want to highlight it. Here's the frightening truth. People will almost always choose safety and comfort over freedom. Mark it down. Take note of it. It is a frightening truth, but it's true. It's a frightening truth because what we really want is freedom, but in our short-sightedness, we humans will almost always choose comfort. You can look through history and check this out. It's actually how most governments get elected, right? They promise more stuff to people right before the election. <laughs> but governments don't typically just give up something without taking back a little bit from you. And usually what they take away is just a little bit of your freedom. We like freedom, but we don't like to have to fight for it or to pay the price that it costs to have it. And if you actually do some study of history and you find the nations that really hungered for freedom, you will find that they had to pay a deep price for it. 
And that's a principle in life as well. You will always have to pay a price if you want freedom. It doesn't come for nothing. And another thing that we learn is that we quickly forget what it was like to be in slavery. The Israelites have obviously forgotten very quickly. They're romanticizing what it was like to be there as slaves because they could eat meat and bread, right? Guys, this is a great life. We have such good... Do you think, how often do you think they were out there in the fields getting whipped, right? Making bricks and talking about how great the food was. You think that's really what their conversation was? You know what? Christians sometimes forget what it was like to be in slavery too. I've heard Christians sometimes, after they've been walking with God for a while, oh, you know what? Before I started following Jesus, you know, I could do so many other things. You ever hear Christians talk like that? It's very disappointing. No, actually, if you remember correctly, you were a slave to those things right? They had control of you. You were not free at all. It wasn't a good life. You were talking into the big white telephone every weekend after you drank too much, right? Like you were not in control of that situation. You know, Jesus has set us free from the slavery of sin. Let's never go back there. Let's keep moving forward in freedom. There's a cost to pay, but it's better. Well, the Lord has Moses back and he tells him that he's actually going to rain bread down from heaven. That's a nice thing. Thank you, Lord, right? Moses was pretty happy, but he says it's going to be a test. Now, how? How is this going to be a test? Well, God tests our faith by how well we obey without grumbling. This is something else that we see consistently, right? Jesus even said it. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Right? So God tests our faith by how well we obey without grumbling. Here's a fact. We demonstrate faith and maturity when we obey God without grumbling. I just want to take a second and pray. We're going to continue. I'm not done. Don't get your hopes up. But we should pray right now. Let's pray. Lord, in our times of difficulty... And we all go through them. Some are in deep places right now. Would you help us to remain humble? Help us to voice our struggles to you, but to do that with a spirit of humility and a spirit of faith. Lord, please protect us from bitterness. Protect us from negativity. Protect us from crossing that line. Lord, you're okay with us bringing our grief to you. You invite us to. But help us, Lord, like Job, not to cross that line. There's a line where we become flippant with you. We call your character into question and your faithfulness. Lord, help us to be mature in the way that we deal with with our struggles. May we demonstrate faith by the way that we can obey and also to do it without grumbling and complaining. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me ask you, do you think that God provided for the Israelites simply because they grumbled? How many of you think so? No, of course not. He's God and they're his people. He was going to provide for them. We're quick to grumble. God wanted the people to know that he heard their grumbling. In fact, you can see that he heard them because of the two things that they complained about. He addresses them directly. Did you see what they were? The first one was meat. We definitely want more meat. Who doesn't want more meat, right? And then secondly, bread. And they ate bread to the full back in Egypt, right? So God's going to give them meat and he's going to give them bread. And he's going to give them quail that evening just to kind of fill their bellies, get them off to a good start, and then manna every morning afterward. This is the plan. This is what Moses is communicating to them. I wonder how pleased, though, he was to provide this food for them after they had just grumbled for it, right? Sometimes when you're the one serving the food, it's all about the attitude with which it is received. It's kind of funny. Have you ever noticed the different 
ways that mom is able to serve mashed potatoes? Anyone? <laughs> Has anyone ever noticed the way that they get served when you are a grateful child and thankful? Thank you, mom. Thank you for all the work you put into this meal. You're welcome, you know? Versus when you've been complaining and griping about everything. Yeah, I don't like this, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> right? There's different ways that mashed potatoes can be served. Um, you know what? God keeps his word. And whether he was, you know, whether they were receiving it the right way or not, God was still going to keep his word. Years later, in Numbers chapter 11, the people grew weary of manna and complained that they wanted meat again. And I don't know if you're familiar with the story, but remember, God said that he was sending manna to test them. We already read that here. And the test was obedience without complaining. We clarified that. And that they would be blessed by having no disease if they did. Okay, we've covered all of this. But if you go to Numbers chapter 11, it's interesting. Because when they complain again there, they fail the test. And God gets upset. And God basically says, you want meat, do you? And if you know the story, look at what it says in Numbers chapter 11. God says, you shall not eat just one day or two days or five days or 10 days or 20 days, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying, wept meaning whined and cried before him saying, why did we come out of Egypt? God says, you want meat? Here comes the meat, right? And then God causes a wind to blow in from the sea and it blows in more quail than anyone had ever seen in their life. It's actually two cubits deep, which is three feet deep of quail. Look at what it says in verse 33 of Numbers chapter 11. While the meat was yet between their teeth, before it was consumed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people and the Lord struck down the people with a very great plague. God keeps his word, right? He keeps his word on the good stuff. He keeps his word on the bad stuff. He keeps his word. And they named the place the Graves of Craving. Good name. Our selfish cravings make us grumble, and our grumbling is often our undoing. We make our own grave. Well, I just took a little rabbit trail to show you what would happen, but let's get back to Exodus chapter 16. God did as he promised. Quail came that evening, and then manna in the morning with the dew. And the people said, what is it? Which in Hebrew sounds like manna, mana, mana. It's, what is it? Um, if it was English today and God brought manna and we went out and looked at it, we'd probably say, what's that? What's that? Right? So that's kind of what manna means. What's that? And God gave the people, people with bad accents at least would say, what's that? Anyway, God gave the people directions. Every morning, you gather just enough for the day. And later on, you see in the passage, the instruction was one omer per person. An omer is about two liters, all right? So you could get two liters per person per day. You could bring back to your tent. On the sixth day, you gather enough for two days. Why? The Sabbath, right? God already gave them the command to keep the Sabbath, not to work on the Sabbath. So they're going to collect all of it on the sixth day. God's going to give them double so that they can have enough to pick up so they don't have to work on the Sabbath. And the other rule is never try to take more than what I just told you. Because if you do, it will spoil. Well, sure enough, some of the people disobeyed and they tried to gather more. It's spoiled and even bred worms, right? To make it really gross. Some didn't listen to what he said about the Sabbath. They went out, right, on the Sabbath. They're like, oh, good morning, huh? get some manna. Oh, wait, that's right. God said pick up enough the day before, right? And so they didn't have anything that day. Now, the manna really wasn't that bad. In verse 31, it says it was like coriander seed. It was white. It tasted like wafers made with honey. That's, that doesn't sound, how many of you think that's, that doesn't sound too bad, right? It's like, I like wafers. I like honey. That's not bad. He could have made it taste like anything, right? And it tastes pretty good. Moses and Aaron actually take a jar of it and they put it with the testimony, that's the tablets that Moses received, that would later go in the Ark of the Covenant as a reminder of God's faithful provision for generations to come. And so that's what's going to happen. Now, there are some powerful images here in this passage that I want to cover. You know, in John chapter 6, 
one of the men from the crowd of the 5,000 people that Jesus had just fed, he saw the connection between the bread that Jesus multiplied and the manna that their forefathers ate in the wilderness. He made that connection. Bread from heaven, God, Jesus multiplying bread. He made that connection. In John 6, 32 and 33, Jesus then said to this man and to the other people that were there listening, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So Jesus was saying that he was the true bread that came down from heaven. That manna was just a picture of Jesus who was going to come. And Jesus even said, I am the bread of life. He is the one who sustains us. He is our salvation. Without him, we die like people starving in the desert. That is the picture that is being given. And we actually symbolize that every time we take communion. You realize that? We're remembering that just like the manna fed them in the desert and sustained them and kept them alive, that Jesus sustains us, he sustains our spiritual life, and we eat that bread, and we remember we partake in the life of Jesus. I think there's a lesson to be gleaned in the rules for the manna as well. God wanted them to eat that, collect it every day, and not take more than they could get for that day, except for the Sabbath. And the lesson is that God wants us to feed on the bread every day. Before Israel would finally enter the promised land, Moses elucidated them on what God was teaching them with the manna for all of those years. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. He says, And he humbled you, and he let you hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Why did he do all that? That he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. There was a very important lesson in the manna that God is the one who feeds you. It is the bread of God. It is the word of God. You know, I know sometimes the word of God can seem bland, right? You're getting up in the morning, you want to read a little bit, and you're like, oh, well, the internet is much tastier, right? much tastier, spicy, right? You can, you can find all kinds of tasty nuggets there on the internet. But the word of God and Jesus, who is the living word of God, they actually sustain us. So much different. And God wants us every day, right? You don't just try to store up for future days. Every day, he wants us to be in this. He wants us to be feeding on the word of God. Join us on Sundays at 4 p.m. for our weekly service at 7755 10th Line North, Mississauga. Or visit renewchurch.ca slash connect for more information about how you can get connected at Renew Church.